Thanks, Stephen. Um, I will try not to wander terribly far from the mic. I think we've been a pacer, so I'll try and stay um, pretty still. Um, I suppose just a little bit um, about myself. Um, I work uh, for the Open University, as you, you can see. Um, so Janice wrote me into all of these uh, things. Um, I currently work in, in, in Nottingham, but my um, background, my PhD and stuff like that, is in military history. I, I look primarily at um, insurgency and counterinsurgency, particularly from 1919 onwards. Um, mostly at, at, at the British Army in the 1920s and 30s, but also some kind of comparative thing to look at other armies during that period as well. Um, so I suppose that's where um, I'm coming from and sort of uh, my background. So I'm reaching a little bit earlier than that um, to talk uh, tonight. Um, so um, just to sort of explain what I suppose the format of the lecture, I'm going to try and keep to the same structure that, that, that Janice has been using. And well, the, now that I look at the first lines as background history of the British Army, it seems a lot to try and get through in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but I tend mainly to look at the sort of 19th and 20th century um, and just to talk through the changes that took place um, within the army itself and to talk about some of the conflicts and, and other things that they were engaged in. And that's just to give you a sense of. Um, you know, the kind of experiences or the potential experiences that any family member um, could have had um, during that um, period. So, because it's officers and soldiers, I'm sticking to primarily um, the army, but you know, during the kind of questions and answers session, we can talk about the other, um, you know, the Royal Navy or, or, or the RAF. Um, and I think the bit at the end um, as well will, will, will be useful. So what I'm also going to do then is talk a little bit about the British Army in Ireland in the 19th and early uh, 20th century um, and, uh, and on a little bit of that just to sort of relate it to kind of this area um, in particular um, and just sort of explain kind of things like the structures and, um, and, and, and generally what they were, what they were doing. Um, and then lastly, just to sort of point you to material which would be potentially useful, if you like, from research into your own family history and material that will give you um, perhaps a greater insight into um, the experiences of any kind of family member who was part of um, various kind of um, either the Army, uh, Navy, or um, later the Royal Air Force. Um, so that's essentially the structure um, of, the, of the talk, and so we, you know, we'll quite happy to kind of um, take questions. Um, so I, I suppose this is, just go back to um, the early part of the 19th century. I mean, you, this is your standard sort of um, recruiting kind of drive, get them drunk and get them into the army before they have a chance to sober up or kind of realize they're making a terrible mistake. Um, and really, I suppose no, uh, no more then or no more then than now. Um, I was talking some there recently, the British Army needs something like four or five thousand, or British Defence Force needs four or five thousand recruits a year. You know, that's the annual uh, turnover, essentially, the people leaving and, and so on, because, you know, you get some men for a three year short service commission, they're gone after the three years. So, um, so the Napoleonic Wars essentially see a kind of mass um, mobilisation um, of manpower because Britain is not used to having a large um, standing army and has all, was always essentially hostile um, to the concept of a standing army which later of course transfers to the Americans who don't like the, the idea and um, it's rather odd given their military kind of might now that they, they too are, are um, begin in that way so uh, while the Navy is seen as vital to protecting British interests and protecting British trade the army is seen as potentially um, something that can be turned on the people. Of course, you things like the Peterloo Massacre and, and other things. So the, the, ar the army is not, um, and nor is the army held, our soldiers in particular are not held in high esteem. They're generally seen as coming from the kind of dregs of society, or if not from the dregs of English society, coming from Scotland, Ireland, or, or Wales. Um, and, you know, because I think about 30 35% of the British army at Waterloo was Irish. Um, uh, and probably another 35% were Scottish. 
So, you know, again, because you join these things because it's, well, partly adventure but partly poverty, which generally drives enlistment in most um, areas. So, um, again, apart from the, after the Napoleonic Wars, the numbers drop down again, maintain, well, when you, you know, they're twice the size of the, the current army, they're usually around, in and around the 200,000 um, for a lot of the, the period. Um, and obviously we're not going to go into the Indian Army and, and, and other things, which becomes, of course, a major um, source of manpower and the preferred source of manpower for a lot of issues. Um, the, one of the other sides of things, I suppose, as well, is that in terms of enlistment, and this is a, an old kind of ballad, and it's just one um, um, chapter, or one verse out of it, which is, um, you know, that the, the, the essential, I suppose, the thing of um, rock bone is that the person singing it says they'd rather actually be a soldier than work for any farmer, right? So for a lot, again, going back to the idea of, of coming from particular backgrounds, um, and agricultural backgrounds and so on. You, know, you could either you know, work as a labourer or work on the railways in the UK as they're being constructed um, as an abbey and so on. And the army seems more attractive um, to most of them. And um, you know, it, it also offers that chance of seeing the world or maybe you know, seeing um, India or, or whatever. Um, so it, it, the other point, I suppose, of this is the in the 19th century, from the Napoleonic Wars, on, you know, the uh, king and country, you know, for anyone coming from here, meant king or a queen in Ireland. You know, um, and the, I suppose, you know, you have to look at these things in the context of the way people divide up now, but the term Irish is very uncontentious, um, you know, and regardless of your background. Um, and, you know, the Irish regiments are the Irish regiments, and um, Richard Holmes in his book, The Red Coat, you know, mentions two incidents in the, in the Peninsular War where an Irish officer is walking into a bar in Portugal or Lisbon when the English officer greets him and says, I can smell the Irish coming. And uh, whereupon the Irish officer draws his dagger, cuts off the British officer's nose and says, how do we smell now? <laughs> and, um, and then the other one was that the one officer meets two Connacht kind of Rangers who are standing over a French prisoner. And he can hear them talking, he can't pick out the language. And as he, walk, as he walks over, two kind of rangers simply execute the prisoner. And he runs over, you know, you can't go around executing uh, prisoners. And he said, well, he was Irish. And he was in a French uniform. You know, he was a traitor to king and country. Um, so when you go back, and when you're reading primary material from the period, You'll find sort of attitudes, I suppose, that are somewhat, I think, different and maybe surprising uh, to our own. Um, just to quickly go through the, I suppose, the army and the period. The only major war, really, that, um, or that you could just say in the, in the middle of the 19th century is the Crimean War, which absorbs, I think, a huge, again, section of of the British um, forces, and of course the Irish regiments, um, and so on. So again, it's, it's a war, like most of the wars, was driven by policy and imperial policy in particular, and this is designed really to stop the Russians, you know, pressuring the Turks and taking territory in, in the Balkans or from the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Indian Rebellion, or Indian Mutiny, um, is, is important in the period as well because it ends the East Indian Army Company, which is insignificant for the Irish regiments because a lot of the um, East Indian Army or East Indian Army regiments become Irish regiments, um, and um, so you know even though um, you know it, it and of course the British take a different um, view to garrisoning India in that much more um, of British regiments are sent out and it becomes much more important to keep them in India. So there's constant tours of duty in India. So if you ever have a family member in the army during that period, they would have seen service um, in India. And um, I found the documents, um, which somewhat relates to the, the, 
two of these are supposed to walk once into Crimea and India in that um, someone asked me to find the records of their great great kind of grandfather who had joined and this is another point he joined 17 Lancers which is not necessarily an Irish but the he was in India from the 1920s or the 1820s and 30s fighting in the Maharaja Wars and he just retires before Crimea and his entire record is sort of traced um, um, through that. So anyone during the period, particularly the later period, would see services or service in, in India. The other thing that I suppose the volunteer movement is is um, is the emergence of sort of the militia um, county associations and things in this sort of spur for volunteering. Um, it's not the, the volunteer kind of movement or, that you see here in the 18th century. This is, you know, they're somewhat separate but driven by some of the same social um, issues and the militias are, are important in that one of the things that I suppose people think about in terms of soldiers, officers and stuff like that is you, you, you automatically I think always focus on the regular forces, the regular battalions, the regular army but it's highly likely that you know if you're tracing the military career of some of your family members you'll find that a lot of them could have served in local um, militias. Um, and, you know, they never left the country, but they spent 20, 25 years in the army in the local militias. Um, and so, um, it, it's a movement that the government tries to regulate later on in the Haldean reforms um, we'll get to uh, um, later. Um, one of the issues, of course, that a lot of the foreign wars, a lot of the things that the British Army is engaged in, um, uh, point to the, I think the need the points of the British government to the need that they need to reform the army they need to professionalize the army and one of the starts of that is the children's reforms um, in 1881 um, which essentially means that you cannot buy your commission uh, anymore okay and um, I think as Janice has given you to link it into some of the other talks is that you know, this sort of sense of the professionalization of things, you know, the creation of the professions, essentially medicine, law, accounting, or, you know, all of these sort of things is happening during the period in the army isn't any different. And, of course, they're looking to, you know, the French and to the Europe, European continent as well, who are probably ahead of the British army in terms of kind of military education, particularly the education of officers. Um, the other thing that Childers reforms, I suppose, does as well is it creates a lot of the kind of famous regiments that we know up to that point. It's some, you know, it's like the 66 foot or the 87 foot, or whatever. So they're renamed, and battalions are combined into regiments. And we'll look at that um, later on um, as well. And Britain regards itself, I suppose, particularly as um, you know, learning by experience in terms of imperial policing on the frontiers. Um, and most of the 19th century British Army spends doing that kind of thing. Um, and which becomes, I suppose, somewhat problematic again in the Boer War. It's a map, it's kind of not a mass mobilization to the scale of the Napoleonic Wars um, or uh, the late, later First World War. Um, but it's different, I suppose. Crimea is the beginning of war reporting in many ways for the UK press, but the Boer War tends to turn the spotlight into it, um, onto the actions of the army. You get way more um, correspondence out there, um, even you know, Churchill and so on. Um, but I suppose the, the thing about the Boer War is it starts to somewhat change the relationship um, with the army prior to World War One, World War One transforms it in that because most people have served in uniform, or a lot of people have served, the families have seen service, that the army and the role in the way people perceive soldiers becomes different. But there's a certain amount of that happening in the Boer War, kind of imperial glory, um, things like the khaki election, you know, which fought on the war and so on, and the kind of sense of creating or the beginning of the creation of a kind of contract or a military contract that they talk about. But the other side, I suppose, as well, is that some of the militia units in Ireland do actually serve in Boer War in what now is kind of quite recognisable in what's called 
force protection, which would be the name given to it in Afghanistan and other things, which is that you're protecting bases and lines of operation. So the militias go out, but not for a year long stint, but not to essentially protect, and not to actually engage in, in operations in the field, but to do protecting bases and, and to relieve soldiers for other duties. Um, there's endless colonial conflicts, so, you know, and global, so you know, people will have fought in Africa, Asia, um, you know, Latin America, um, and that is the principal business of the army in the 19th century. It's why Britain, you know, Britain's army is smaller than the European armies in Rome, but it's much more active, and it sees much more service. But the service that it sees is usually, I don't know if you've seen the Black Adder, um, episode where Hugh Laurie, or Hugh Laurie's character is quizzing Blackadder on, you know, why he isn't so enthusiastic about World War I, because he's a professional soldier. And he's used, well, you know, I joined, you know, essentially to deal with natives armed with sharp fruit, not a million heavily armed Germans. And uh, so it's that kind of thing. So they, they cut their teeth in that, but it actually impacts on the kind of training officers receive. They're not, they don't do the kind of which is why Haldine, in his reforms, tries to reform it somewhat. They don't do the kind of German general staff kind of thing or the Oberkommando that they don't, they're not regarded, I suppose, and they have a certain suspicion of intellectual soldiers, where in Germany and France, that's not the case. You know, they want their um, officers, you know, most of the French general staff or most of the French senior generals would have lectured in the French military college. Um, and likewise the German generals. Um, so, um, and again, I mean, it impacts as well on the beginning in terms of the RAF in the 1920s and 30s because the RAF is used to using planes, you know, for imperial policing. It doesn't really develop kind of the fighters and, and the other things that it needs, but obviously it develops them faster um, in, the late, in the later 1930s, but it doesn't, its, its doctrine or creation of doctrine is, is different. <coughs> Um, Haldine um, follows on from the children's uh, reforms. Um, I know this is sort of true <coughs> a little bit, but um, Haldine's uh, reforms essentially lasted for a long time. I mean, he was the individual who created the territorial army and pushed it through against the wishes sometimes of the generals. He um, created the imperial general staff to mirror. German general staff, and to try and create some coordination between the British and Indian armies. Um, and Kitchener and Hay would have worked closely with Haldi to develop all of those sort of reforms. Um, so essentially, I mean, I suppose what does that mean in terms of for the ordinary soldiers um, who were serving? Um, I suppose one of the things is there's a growing professionalization um, in the army, and it's growing for a variety of reasons. Growing because politicians are pressuring, um, you know, for more, um, I suppose, um, better prepared officers. They don't want mobility buying commissions anymore. Um, they want officers to go through a particular to Sandhurst and to Staff College, and they want them to be trained up in the profession. And that, you know works its way down to all, all ranks. So in the 19th century, you'll see levels of literacy rising among um, soldiers, just as it happens with the general population, not perhaps as fast in other professions. So um, soldiers are becoming more literate, and, and their pay conditions are, are getting slightly better, not perhaps as, as, as well as, as you might kind of imagine, but generally, tend to improve. Um, and of course they need that as well. They need the ordinary soldiers to be better educated because they're coping as now as with now with a lot of changes to their profession. This is you, know, you go from muskets to machine guns during the period. Um, so you go from you know um, front loaded artillery to breech breech block artillery which is more accurate, more effective. Um, and so all the you know things outside of that that are impacting the rest of the society, telegraph, trains, 
steam power, all of these different things um, are impacting kind of on the life of the soldier. So is the medical side of things. And I suppose one of the things that is interesting from a history point of view, and I'll talk a little more about people's personal records afterwards, that um, Irish and Scottish soldiers, because going back to what I was saying, coming from an agricultural or, or rural background, tend to be bigger than the British recruit, the English recruits. They tend to be taller and broader, heavier. And some British generals, um, then actually there was one British general and um, started with our own wooden command and a British regiment because he, he didn't want, or he didn't want British division because he didn't want slum birds from working class parts of England. He wanted to wait until they got an Irish or Scottish division. Um, you know, so uh, there's, you know, there's a sort of reverse kind of prejudice in one sense there, you know. Um, but the, the army remains a, prof a professional in the sense that um, it's not conscripted, unlike their European counterparts. Um, but French conscripts don't serve overseas. That's, I suppose, the difference in that, um, or rarely do, because the French have their a colonial army like the way the British have the Indian um, army. Um, the problem, I suppose, from one perspective, and one of the issues um, which historians often point out, that despite all the reforms, despite everything, you still retain a very hierarchical institution, you still retain a class bond institution. Um, and one of the things that the Irish regiments do, um, particularly the um, uh, our Munsters, Dobbs, all those regiments, is that they become a place where English Catholic officers find a bird, find a home. So you'll find a lot of uh, English Catholic officers in the Irish Guards and in the Irish regiments in general. Um, uh, so, you know, because they won't. They, they don't go into the other things. And um, um, even up to was it two years ago, I, I was in a conversation with former British officer Cranwell, and his point was, well, you can actually have natives commanding native troops. And I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. And um, but and I suppose part of that actually leads on to the the, the the army, despite the kind of wishes of the politicians. It doesn't learn the lessons of things like the American Civil War. It doesn't learn the lessons of the Russia-Japanese War, where firepower has become much more important, where the defensive um, has become much more difficult to deal with. Um, you know, it's fine to use machine guns um, in the Sudan, but you don't people don't imagine that they'll be used on, um, you know, on the scale that they do get used on later on in the Western Front. Um, so, essentially. You know, in during I suppose the period is that okay? It's over a hundred years. It's a hundred years of a huge change in, in many ways, uh, um, because as someone pointed out once that you know Washington couldn't communicate. George Washington couldn't communicate with his army any faster than Julius Caesar could have. Okay, but that totally changes, particularly during the late 19th century. There's a huge technological revolution, and some of the thinking at top ranks probably doesn't catch up. Although it, it catches up better than maybe some of the times they're given credit for. Um, and I think so. Again, just to suppose go to this is the sort of map which gives you the distribution of the regiments. And one of the things that the Childers reforms did was to give regiments recruiting areas. Okay. They were given specific, and they had county recruiting associations and so on, particularly in the UK. Um, now, this is just the infantry. Obviously, other units like artillery and, 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 and others can recruit on a much broader basis. The technical engineering units, artillery, they can recruit on a wider basis. Um, and so you get the monsters are in all the West Monster, I suppose, and the Royal Irish Regiment has currently stands, of course, covers here, but it used to be um, the regiment for Tipperary and um, Waterford and Kilkenny. Um, the Connacht Rangers, essentially Connacht, um, the Niskill and Fusiliers for Manna, Donegal and so on. So I'll talk a little bit more about the Royal Irish uh, Rifles later, the Royal Irish Fusiliers, Leinster Regiment and the Dubs. And of course, the um, um, Leinsters were also called the Canadians. Well, Canadians, because um, um, and the Royal Military College in Canada has all their mess silver because there's that connection with them. They go back kind of quite far 
and um, Munsters were are two regiments of the East Bengal Army, um, hence their adoption of the tiger, Bengal tiger, as their symbol. You know, you might consider a wolfhound normally gets associated with Irish regiments, uh, but their um, um, regimental symbol was the, uh, the tiger. Um, so it gives you a sense of their distribution, and that distribution is also reflected in the militias. Okay? Um, there are little odd quirks um, in that um, in my area, North Cork, North Cork Militia was actually um, made part of the King's Royal Rifle Corps. So it wasn't attached to any of these regiments. It was a militia regiment in Ireland, but not attached to any Irish regiment. It was attached to the Rifle Corps. Um, and um, so it, a little bit different. So you get quirks like that. So sometimes you might think that, oh, well, fine, the Munster Fusiliers Association is bound to have them, you know, if, if it's some North Cork, well, they're bound to have them. But it's not, so you have to dig a little bit deeper sometimes. So you find that these little quirks kind of come up from, from time to time. Um, so again, that gives you a sense of the distribution. And just to kind of, uh, I suppose, my, to emphasize the thing again, the, there, this is the normal structure. I'll do it for the Royal Irish Rifles as well, because I'm going to talk a bit more about um, them. But, um, so you can see there's two regular battalions, and this is the children's reforms, okay? And they were formerly, their, their former names are there, the 101st foot and the 104th foot, and they were the Royal Bengal Fusiliers and the Bengal Fusiliers. They become the first and second battalion. Um, and then the militia are the reserve battalions. They're not, they don't change in Ireland during the Haldane reforms. They remain militia battalions, unlike the TA battalions in Britain. So the Irish don't change in 1907 when this kind of happens. And my thinking about that really is that they just didn't want the political fallout of trying to change Irish militia units into territorial units and get involved in that kind of debate with politicians here. Um, so again, all of those would be there, so you can see all of these militia units, and, and essentially, you know, you can see there's, you know, there's three battalions of militia to two of the regulars, and the Royal Irish Rifles are the same. Their first and second battalions come from the 83rd and the 86th foot, okay? Um, so they're merged into the Royal Irish Rifles, um, and. It's, I suppose it's, it's one thing that the, you know, they become part of that quite a separate tradition in the British Army. The rifles kind of operate differently, they march differently, with a faster marching pace. Um, and of course after um, 1921, from the Royal Ulster Rifles, um, their battalions again are the 3rd, 4th and 5th Militia Battalions, and they relate to Down and Antrim and Loud. Um, so that was their area given to them as the recruiting um, area for them. And, you know, again, you know, people could have spent their entire career in something like the Antrim militia, 30 years, but never have gone overseas. So, um, you know, you, and you might not, you know, but the records will still essentially be there. So life for them would have been the same as any other regiment. One would be based in Britain and Ireland, and one would be in India. So one is always in India or overseas, and one is based in UK and Ireland. They're not necessarily based in their county, in their own recruiting areas. They can be very mobile. Um, so you could have an Irish regiment based in Aldershot, or an Irish battalion and an English battalion based here in Belfast. And one of the things about that, again, if you're going into your family background, it means that don't assume that because this area was recruiting simply for the Royal Irish Rifles, who, you know, who were looking to Antrim, Down, and Loud, you know, if an English battalion was based in the barracks here, um, uh, well, I'll talk more about finding them later on, but if you, you're, your family could have joined an English um, regiment, or a Welsh regiment, or a Scottish regiment, depending on who was there when they walked up to the barracks. 
Um, for example, I think, you know, Rourke's Drift is a very famous action for the Welsh Regiment, and in the movie they all have Welsh accents, but, you know, there was actually, you know, maybe half of them at Rourke's Drift were Welsh, you know, and the rest came from Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and, and they enlisted because that was the unit that was easiest to enlist in, in their area. So there's two ways they can actually go to a recruiting depot here and join the Royal Irish Rifles, or they can go and into other units. The thing is that, as I said, the pressure for manpower means that if anyone turns up in another <coughs> regiment, they're not going to... So if the Hampshire Regiment was in Belfast and someone turns up and said, I'd like to join the army, they're not going to tell them, go and join the Royal Irish Rifles because this is their recruiting area. They're going to say, thank you, and get them in, right? Because they need the manpower as well, so it's a competitive sort of thing. So, you know, and of course, obviously, then you have you know um, the navy uh, and later on the RF and others will recruit on a kind of national basis. So, the experience, I suppose, is that anyone of your family who's been in or was in the Royal Irish Rifles from that period, 1881, up to you know, up to you know, uh, up to their disbandment. Or, um, almost true most of it that century from the Boer War on would have seen action of some sort somewhere. Right? I think there is only one year in the twentieth century that the British Army was not on active operations. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody sees active operations from time to time, but the likelihood is um, that you will, you know? Um, and uh, uh, because I was speaking to somebody, there was actually an RAF guy, and um, basically saying, what will you do after Afghanistan is over? And very English, I can't, I'm not going to actually try and do the English accent, but the general principle will always be a war. <laughs> we'll always have something to do, you know? And I mean, so, but it's funny once in, but it's true, they were always on operations. They were in India, they were in, you know, Africa, they were whatever. Um, and so the, the rifles from here would have been no different. Um, and I suppose the, but having said that, the issue then of course becomes 19th century goes, World War I happens. And the rifles then have to accommodate that because the government needs to recruit a huge amount of people. Now, the British decided that the best way to do it was to expand existing regiments and give them extra battalions. So some you know, units ended up with having 18 battalions or something in the regiment, which almost makes them you know, two divisions worth of personnel, which is, you know, um, um, each battalion roughly 800 people or whatever, okay? So the, it, that's what they do. The Australians number their battalions. Um, and of course, the numbering system, you either, you know, as you need more, you give them new numbers, and then as you retreat back, you take away the numbers and, and so on. So not all, um, they, the idea was that it would, it would facilitate recruitment. People would be joining what they perceived to be their local regiment in the rifles here in Belfast and that regiment. And so they would, they would feel that sense of loyalty to the area. It'd be easier to get people in, easier to form the kind of PALS battalions of the war period. Um, and also what the belief was, was that they would tap into the regimental tradition. That they would give, they would, it would give them automatically a kind of sense of being soldiers, rather than simply um, conscripts. And that's one of the things that, I suppose, that, that becomes quite strong. And I was just um, explaining to you, I think, Janice and Stephen are uh, on that near a mutiny in, in Italy, in the British Army, in, in one of the bases. And, in, in, in World War II because they were going to send guys who got well after being wounded to units that weren't their own and they wouldn't go. They wanted to go back to their regiment because the regiment is the key and has always been seen as kind of instrumental to the kind of underpinning of British Army life essentially. And it's unique to I suppose the British system. They, they've done um, very well and you know you can see kind of you know regimental associations and a huge kind of culture that surrounds that. And people will always have that sense of being um, part of um, the regiment. So that's what they were tapping into. Um, so this, hopefully, I mean, you can. These, this was a little bit. I mean, it's very short in terms of um, 
a little bit of information on the battalions. But the first battalion was in Aden, right? So it was protecting the sea route there. It was designed to garrison that area, and that's what it was doing when war broke out. And most of, at least, as I said, if one battalion is overseas and one battalion is, is at home, um, apart from the guards, battalions, so the Irish guards, the Welsh guards, got, they don't do that overseas thing, right? Because they're the guards, right? So, um, so they come back, but they actually join regular army divisions, okay? So um, I was looking at the um, display outside and I talk about the 10th, the 16th, and the 36th divisions. So again, if you're assuming that your relative was in one, uh, um, the assumption might be that he was, they were in the 36th division, not necessarily true at the beginning of the conflict. The regular battalions went to the regular divisions because the one thing, that, again, the regimental system was very good and all that, but there's still a huge group of snobbery. The regular soldiers wanted to be in the regular divisions and not deal with the new armies. Right? And because they didn't trust them to fight. These were professional soldiers and they didn't want to mix with the amateurs who were coming into the organization, right? Because, you know, they'd rather go over the top with guys they knew who'd been proven in, in India and Aden and wherever, right? So, but they eventually end up with the 36th um, Ulster Division. The second battalion goes to the third division then to the 25th, the 74th, they're new army divisions, and then they go back to the 36th as they're moved around. So you can have them move between different areas. You can also, what will often happen as well sometimes is that you will have division or regiments, which are, are battalions of the regiments, which are, you know, so you can have the monsters in one unit and the Inskill Fuse in the same, you know, you have the professionals in the same unit. So, and, you get that kind of cross thing. I'm going to talk about, about that in a minute as well. But again, don't assume that, you know, if you're looking for a family member, that they're not in another Irish regiment, that they're not in an Irish regiment that you wouldn't think they wouldn't be in because you think they would be divided up. Um, but that doesn't kind of happen. Um, so the reserve battalions are simply, when you see those, they really don't leave. They're essentially training battalions. They take the num numbers of the militia, right? But they are only training units. So when you enlist, those two are at the front, okay? They don't have time to train people. Um, so their hands are full with Germans and dealing with the Germans on the other side. So these are the training. These are the training units for the new armies and for the first and second regulars, okay? Um, and they're called service battalions. Um, essentially, the 6th is formed in Dublin and is attached to the 10th Irish Division. And the 10th Irish Division is a mixed division. Even though it's seen sometimes as a nationalist division, it really isn't because it's activated before the other two. People in Belfast and, and in the North who, who want to join and who want to fight and want to take part in war before it's all finished in two months, enlist in the tent. So the tent is quite mixed in terms of being all Ireland and being all religions. And it gets written out of conflict, I think, partly because it's so you know, everyone talks about the 16th and the 36th because they're easy to pigeonhole <coughs> as divisions representing respective traditions. And it's also, they're more attractive because they, they're on the Western Front. And as we know, nothing else happens in World War I apart from the Western Front, right? Um, so the poor tent have the misfortune to spend most of their time in Salonika or Palestine. So, you know, it's not, it's not one of those attractive campaigns. They're fighting the Bulgarians in Salonika and then the Turks in Palestine. So, you know, um, so their actually war experience is very different to the individuals in the 16th and the 32nd, because, or 36th, because in 
Bulgaria are in Slag. It is a bit of a it is trench warfare as well, but not to the same extent as Western Front. And in Palestine, it's a much more free moving campaign. It's not really bombed by trenches. So their experience of the war is fundamentally different to the other two um, battalions. So again, they're um, um, formed up as well. The seventh are formed up in Belfast, and again sent to the 16th Irish. Um, Division, and then they eventually end up with the 36th Ulster uh, Division later on. So they, they can move around between divisions because the, the British Army is not really that terribly concerned about what you do. So a lot of these units, a lot of the ones that you think, um, uh, you know, um, I was reading um, private papers by a guy called Starrett, and you know, his unit, which I think were the Carson's Young Volunteers or whatever, you ended up having a load of Liverpool Irish Catholics in them. For no other reason than they moved to Liverpool and they recruited a load of them. So you know it's it's it, it's it's quite different. And then, as you see there, the, the Jersey militia joins up with the seventh. And um, one of the, the things in ter um, when training in uh, Tipperary was that the you could hear all these kind of singing French songs going through the street. And they were taught they were training the French army, but in British uniforms. But it was all these Jersey guys who were you know Mason, you know. French was kind of mostly their first language in many cases. So, um, and you know, because even in Jersey today, people have to go to France to train as lawyers. So, you know, because the Jersey law is different. So, um, but I suppose just to talk a little bit, there are the other um, battalions. So, you've East Belfast, um, um, West Belfast, South Belfast, and so you know, they're all um, because they're from the traditional recruiting areas. And the garrison battalion is formed in Dublin and goes off to India to replace the regular battalions who've left and come to the Western Front. And, and so they're um, destined for there, but the rest of them um, are there in that sense. So um, going into the 10th, the 16th, and the 36th, um, and one of the nice ones about, I think, the, um, one of the Belfast units, which would have been uh, uh, part of the 36th, there's a story of them going into the trenches in 1916, and they were replacing the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Munster Fusiliers, who were coming out. And of course, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Munster Fusiliers is a regular battalion of pre-war professionals. There are still some of them left, um, despite the best efforts of their own generals and Germans. Um, <laughs> in, you know, in that 16. So they're coming out. And it's one of it's Carson. It's the Carson's um, battalion going in, and of course, the taunting uh, starts as they're going by. And the monster said, "It's we Carson's lads finally turned up for the fight, and they ought to bugger off your you know." And it was, <laughs> but it's just I always think it's kind of one of those nice kind of passages. But generally, the Irish battalions actually, regardless of things, get on very well. It's banter. It wasn't really, you know, because. Officers have to be taken from all of the existing Irish regiments to professionalise each of those battalions. So they can end up with NCOs and they can end up with officers who are coming from the Dubs or the Munsters or wherever. And so you see officers <coughs> moving quite a bit between battalions. Not, you know, um, unfortunately sometimes because they, they have to be. Um, so um, uh, just to sort of, you know, if you are interested in and, and chasing it up. There are a few documents and other things that you can look at. Um, and I tend to look at some of these um, uh, you know, from time to time more towards the end of this list than towards the top, but I've seen, I will track down personal records from time to time if I have to find the background of someone. Personal records are pre-1922 or kept in the National Archives of Kew. Okay, so if you're looking for your um, uh, a record, you know, of someone who served in the British Army at that point, or pre that point. So, someone whose career ends in the Army in 1921, 22. If they go beyond that, so if they enlist in 1914 and stay there to the 30s, their records are held in Glasgow, right, in the Army Personnel Centre, and you have to write to them and establish a sort of relationship or a reason for looking at the records, and. You know, nicely, I suppose, from our point of view, you can I'm a historian, therefore I want to have a look at the record. And by and large, you'll get an abbreviated version of it. Um, the other um, things is that 
you will find there are books called the Army Lists. They are particularly good for tracking the career of an officer. It's time consuming, but you can follow a guy's career through the Army Lists if they're an officer. Um, and going back to personal records, I suppose, enlisted men, the division continues post whatever. Enlisted men rec records are usually on microfilm. Officers' records, you can get the personnel file. Okay, so, you know, um, and you can, you know, you can and read through And, you know, sometimes reading through the ones of World War One are quite kind of direct because you will get the letter to the parents saying, you know, he was a brave young lad and and parents writing back saying thanks for telling me and you know and so you get you get uh, you get material that's simply it's not just um but you know it's not just the, the raw kind of details um the army lists also are very useful in tracking the movement of battalions because they detail where the battalion is so in other words if they're in Kashmir or if they're in galway right they'll tell you where they are so trying to track a regiment's um, progress. Again, you can do relatively quickly using the army list. Um, there, I think the name of, there was um, a book I think privately produced um, in Ireland. I think the title was Forlorn Hope, which actually listed for all the barracks in Ireland all the units that had served there. So, you know, from the Napoleonic period on to now, who was doing their stint in Balmina or wherever, okay? So you can track a regiment through that as well, or through the army lists. Or indeed, you know, you will have substantial unit records, and Prony has war diaries, isn't it, from the units, some of the units, and, you know, the, I'll uh, put up a slide of one of them in a minute. Um, so they, um, unit records, you know, are things like, um, low, you know, the, the regiment's own court martial lists, attestation records, general kind of records that could give you an idea of, say, who served with your um, family members. Um, you know, who was their officer. You might find a famous officer, you might find they hadn't, you know, whatever. But you, what you're talking about really is not simply trying to reconstruct, you know, kind of get the bare bones, but the kind of full extent of their career, uh, you know, in terms of what did they do, what was life like for them, who were they, who were they with, and what was their experience like on the front, well, on the northwest frontier or on the western front. And you can track that through all this material. You get very good regimental histories. Okay, um, some are quite old, some are, are, are new ones. I think the, um, I think the Black Watch Commission one recently, of course, on their demise. But you get divisional histories. So you get some like Sir Falls, 36th Division, you know, which is quite a good book. Um, um, not really so readily available for the other two Irish divisions, the 10th and the 16th. Um, but I imagine that that will be, or hopefully will be, rectified um, in the next few years because primarily publishers will see a market in it. You also have official histories. Um, the British Army consistently turns out official histories of campaigns. And partly that is going back to the Childers and the Holding Reforms and the idea of educating the officer class to pass on the lessons of past campaigns. It doesn't always work, but it's done and it, so you can get a sense of at least the environment and most of the time you know there are people who are writing them are historians so they actually they're not simply everything is wonderful and hunky dory they do detail and things and they make critiques of the generals they make critiques of tactics because that's what they're there for it's the official history is a reflection on the event and you get people's personal papers as i said if you're um if your family member, uh, you know, was, um, uh, you know, someone who was attached to a major officer or whatever, um, you know, um, all, most officers had batmen or, or generals had personal servants who were soldiers. Um, you know, he would have gone through his career with that general, and so would have been where they were, would have been in the rooms they were in, and again, you get a sense of going back and finding out what their life. Um, was essentially like. Um, so the personal record will sorry say, you know, them your name, your rank, when they were promoted. Okay? So it details promotions, um, it details training, where they served, um, any disciplinary issues to tell the person who asked me to look for the 
um, Slough and Q, that great great granddad had spent a few weeks in prison, military prison, um, but that didn't stop him becoming a regimental sergeant major. Um, you know, so, um, but you get a sense of their, but you also get a sense of the person because it tells you their height, tells you their education, tells you their eye colour, hair colour, you know, um, what their face shape is like sometimes, you know, it, you know, it, it gives you a, it gives you a kind of mental picture of the person. Um, uh, and uh, so it, it's very um, useful. They will be split sometimes if they, if they go, if they leave and enlist in different regiments, paperwork can become fragmented. And again, we're all at the mercy of someone keeping decent records. So, you know, their quartermasters, if they're untidy or if they're not that efficient, may lose material or, or whatever. But uh, personal records, because of pensions and other things, tend to have to be maintained. Um, so, the other way of, if you have medals um, from someone, you can actually figure out where they were a little bit as well. So, um, the first medal, these are all World War II medals, and um, they're the stars, and if you, they recently issued the new Arctic star after about 50 years of campaigning for the guys who were doing the Murmansk run, right? So, the first one is 1939-45 star, so that means fought in World War II. Um, the next one is the North African star, so it was part potentially of the 8th Army, okay, served in North Africa. Um, to, you know, any books, any material on that gives you a sense of that campaign. Next one is the Italy star. Um, and so, the, it's likely now this person was in the 8th Army, because the 8th Army can use campaign to Italy. The next one is 19, France and Germany star, and then the defense medal. So, they were also involved in Northern Europe as well at some point. So you can get a sense, even if you just have their medals, you know, from a um, um, family member, you can get a quick glance, and if you, you know, there, there are lots of guides. There are two quite little good books there by Peter Drucker's, there are Shire, you know, these little Shire books that you see on um, British campaign medals, and they will, they, he's very comprehensive in all of those. And the one thing about British medals as well is that they usually contain at the back the name of the individual and their service number. And having their service number, of course, is critical to tracking down their paperwork. Okay, so you get the medals and you'll be able to um, uh, see, you know, so if that's your starting point, it actually can be quite a good starting point. Um, this is a war diary, it's not perhaps coming out that well. To thank Janice for this, she loved it to me. This is your full copy. But basically, during World War I and World War II, um, most units keep war diaries. And what a war diary essentially is, is, is what it says, it keeps a daily record of what they did. Um, so, you know, in World War I, it could be trench raids, it could be anything, it could be the mundane as well, you know, we left this town and we marched for five days or whatever, and so each day is, we marched today from wherever to, you know. Um, and so, it, but it can contain, again, these can be quite patchy because it's down to the officer, the adjutant, who's responsible for keeping them. So some of them just write in the basics and some of them like writing long diary entries giving you everything that happened in the battalion that day. Um, most of these are going online. There's a project in the National Archives in Kew about putting all of these online. So again, it would be something that you would be able to access without too much effort. And so particularly for World War I and World War II, you'll, you'll find that the material, so again, it gives you a sense on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, what was happening in the unit that your family member was in. Um, it could record things like discipline and, and other things as well. Um, record in tactics, it'll record people who die in the day. So it, it'll, you know, it can be, uh, as I said, it, it can be really useful, and the best ones are, and sometimes it can be problematic. But regardless as well, I suppose one of the things is that if, you know, you could have had people in, or any one of you could have family members in the Australian Army, in the New Zealand Army, right, because they all keep this kind of records. Okay, so this is not an unusual thing, it's a kind of an operational log that they have to keep. Um, so any of the things, and the Australians are actually brilliant as well. Most of the war diaries 
for World War I and World War II are downloadable from the Australian War Memorial. Everything is up there. All their official histories are actually free to download. Um, essentially because I suppose Australia has, you know, has been to the forefront of getting that kind of material up there because number one, people want it, but it's also the distances that they have to cope with that makes that kind of thing more worthwhile for them. So again, it's that kind of material, so it's you know, personal records. This is, if you like, the kind of history of the unit itself uh, and so on. So um, you can look at official histories. This is what you'll see it there, the official history of Great War Military Operations, Volume 1, Inception of the Campaign to May 1915, gives you the guy who wrote it, and that's Gallipoli. So there's two volumes on Gallipoli. There's, you know, I think, um, three on the Palestine campaign, there's that, you know, 16 or 17 on the Western Front. So, you know, if you want to read from now for the next 25 years, <laughs> you will find out about all World War I, you know, and then you can start with World War II, which contains even more official histories. Um, and so, it, it, but they are very good because they often have a lot of maps, they have orders of battle, which tells you, you know, how the division was constituted, where, what regiment, where what battalion was. Um, they will focus in because they're quite detailed on the actions of individual companies um, from time to time. So if you're looking, so you can get down into detail and again it gives you a good sense of, um, you know, what people experienced. Um, now, um, you know, so it doesn't, you know, it's not sometimes as good as personal paper. Personal papers are the, own, the person's own reflections and things like that. But. Um, it, it gives good context. So the 10th Division, again, you know, there were a, a lot of the Irish regiments, a lot of the Irish battalions had, had people at Gallipoli, um, and um, you know the uh, so the and tent itself was there um, before it moved on to kind of Egypt, Salonika, Palestine. So you know it is one that if you're interested in the in the Irish regiments during World War One, it's worth looking at. Um, and you know, and that and the Palestine official history, of course, continues the story of the tent. And you've got regimental histories. So these are um, you know, the history of the Royal Irish Rifles and the Royal Irish in, in, in a world war. Probably dates that a little bit because obviously it doesn't identify which world war. So um, you know, written in the 1920s or 30s. So, but he, a lot of the a lot of guys who write these during the period have have served in the regiments. So they have a real feel for the kind of regimental culture of the regiment, um, and you know, I mean, they're they're easy to get now because of this kind of on-demand printing. Before you'd have to pay a fortune to get these books, but now because they're, as I said, they're sort of on-demand printing, you can get these. They're kind of they PDF them and then they print them off and kind of cover them in those sort of things. So, um, if you're looking for um, personal papers for people. Um, obviously, Prony has some personal papers, and Glenn is going to talk about that in a second. You have some in the National Archives of Q. Um, the National Archives of Q is the main repository, obviously, a government repository for all sort of military records, okay? Apart from the ones the Foreign Office hides <laughs> and doesn't let anyone see um, until they're discovered and then have to be handed over. Um, but the they will have personal records, they will have war diaries, they will have Italian divisional other correspondence. And they, you know, it, there's a wealth of information there. The Indian Army material is now in the British Library and is as detailed. Okay? So if um, one of the things that I suppose the fun, one of the stories of the Indian Army was that a huge amount of the Indian Army's medical service was pop was staffed by Irish doctors. Not himself, and it had the highest desertion rate of any unit because when Dad gave up his medical practice, they didn't wait for their commission to uh, finish, they just left and went over to take over the family practice at home. And eventually, it was just it was the kind of thing they did desert, but they weren't punished for it because the Indian Army is quite happy to just have doctors anyway in the first place. So it was it was a kind of one of those kind of unspoken sort of things. So, um, regimental museums. Um, some very good ones um, here in, in Eskillen and, and uh, in Belfast. Um, and people in those are usually kind of real enthusiasts and are happy to help anyone who has um, queries or questions. Um, 
Imperial War Museum um, in London has a huge amount of, of papers from Irish officers. Um, and so does the Little Heart Centre um, at King's College London. Um, well, one of the things, of course, with the, um, the British Archives is that you you always need to have your letters and paperwork and everything come in to get your cards and all that kind of stuff. You have to, the British Library is very fussy on, on that point and there's no arguing with them. Um, uh, so, um, and anyway, you shouldn't argue with archivists anyway because you need access to the archive. So, <laughs> um, but the, and uh, Leeds also has a special collection, the University of Leeds, where they have material as well on Irish officers. And the reason, of course, that a lot of Irish officers South have left their material there is that by and large they were they, when they retired they retired to the UK or wherever often soldiers retire the last where they're discharged you know where their last base are at least enlisted ranks used to um, and the thing with them uh, I suppose it, you know we talked a little bit about the experience around false but the I mean Irish officers continue the great kind of, I suppose, Anglo-Irish officer class, you know, is really often in charge of the British Army up to the 1950s, when they kind of die out after that point. And the last, I suppose, really, you know, being Templar, who led the campaign against our counterinsurgency in Malaya. Um, and, you know, again, um, you know, it was one of um, Sarkis' career in the Irish regiments. Um, and move forward because if you think about it, if someone joined in 1918 and had a 40-year career and, and retired at 58, you know, um, they would have retired, you know, kind of quite late and, and, and things. So, um, they, and so some of them are there for that um, period of time, um, and of course in the 20th century, you know, the the, the imperial policing reverts, but it becomes a war of decolonization. So. The Inniskillings were involved in the, kind of the Mama campaign, so you get it going forward like that as well. So all of those sort of records are are, are quite valuable. So um, one of the things, I suppose, just to highlight that there are two armies. Um, um, I put this one in just as a sort of um, uh, in case you're wondering what army that is. That is the Irish army in 1939. Um, um, Wearing the Vickers pattern helmet, as it was called, it was manufactured by Vickers in England, who took the manufacturing presses off the Germans as part of the Versailles kind of arrangement, and then were producing these helmets for people. And to add to it, the Irish Army's uniform up to that period was a field grey. So I'm sure when they sort of popped up on the border in 1939, with a few worried individuals who assumed that another army was not arriving on the border. Um, so. If you have any relatives um, who have served uh, in the Defence Forces or the Irish Defence Forces, you'll find that Bureau of Military History and Military Archives and stuff has all of that material. So if you're tracking someone, um, and you may be the reason why would I would want to, but some people have had careers in the British Army and then when they retired, they go and joined or did join the Irish Army. And so, um, and you know the uh, a lot of the when you talk to rank of foreign Irish defence forces, you know, father might have been in the army, grandfather might have been some, right? So the, the military kind of family tradition changes over, and I know you know several guys who started off um, in the British Army, and then after you know serving their six years or whatever, when they came back, they joined. And the Irish Defence Forces. Um, so I know, you know, someone who uh, was a former Royal Irish, uh, you know, uh, individual who then ended up in the 12th Battalion in Limerick. So you know, so you get that kind of crossover. So they may finish their career, and that that's not just the thing. They may also be in the British Army in World War One, and the Australian Army or the American Army in World War Two. Um, and one of the things that you get as well is that. Um, Oddly, ex-German soldiers after World War II end up, of course, emigrating to America and end up in Korea in an American uniform. Um, so, you know, because they have skills, they have whatever else, and you know, so they, they go forward and do that, and then it's a way of trading 
skills for a passport. Um, and you know, the the um, I think one of the I can't remember his name now, but he's about three American chiefs of staff back. Um, his, um, his father was had been a German officer in World War Two, and you know, so it, it, you you get that kind of trend. So just because. Um, you know, so if you're wondering where someone has gone after World War One, and you know, grand uncle or wherever, they could be, they could have gone to um, uh, another army. Could have been in the Americans. Could have been in the um, Australians. And the Americans are also very good. Um, if you, you know, a lot of their material, particularly all their official histories, are available um, online um, as well. So, you know, it, it, I would have to say that I think in terms of careers to track and chase for family history, because there's such a wealth of material on military history and such a wealth of records, it's one of the easiest ones to reassemble someone's life in terms of putting together what they kind of felt, and you know, what they experienced. Um, so, um, I'm not sure who's going next, or is it Glenn?